What's good, ladies and gentlemen? Hmm. It's now the pre-FOMC. This is the most anticipated time in Wall Street. What's the Fed going to do? They're talking about 25 basis points to bring up the interest rate to 5%. Corporate debt refinancing is going to be costing a bomb. Earnings ain't going to be looking too sweet either for some of these companies, especially the banking sector. But the market is not biting that. Keeps on going up. Some guys on Wall Street are suggesting that you sell the rallies. Okay, so we sell the rallies. Take what you can. Some big bad boy billionaire stepping up saying, okay, the markets are due to drop another 22% from this zone. You've also got Morgan Stanley analysts talking about a 26% drop. They are attacking it, but the market is in defiance. Does the Federal Reserve save the economy and protect banks? Or do they work on getting inflation back down? Because ultimately, it's inflation that's caused this problem in the first place. Moving on in this video, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be looking into Bitcoin's price action and a good old little excitement for my XRP gang. XRP's making some big moves. Of course, the court case is coming close to an end and it might end up being in XRP's favor. So we're going to be having a look at that very shortly. We're going to have a look at a couple of other things as well for my guys who are involved in commodities. Now, I'm not sure anyone's really mentioned this, but I think you'll like what I'm about to reveal in relation to commodities. So if you are new to the channel, make sure you hit the like button. Let's get that algorithm play out of the way. Seeing as we're spending all our time trying to work out the algorithm in the stock market and in the Forex market and crypto market. An easy algorithm that we can exploit is the YouTube one. More so, make sure you subscribe so you get notified about tomorrow's live stream. Not just the New York session, which is at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, but when the Federal Reserve pulls out the critical information that we need, which is the press conference, the federal funds rate, the minutes, and of course, the economic projections, which will be released tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which will be 6 p.m. GMT. So... Let's have a conversation, guys. What's been going on in the marketplace today? Okay, firstly, we have good old Bitcoin in the chart on the one hour time frame, holding very well on that one hour 50 EMA. This is what we were saying in the live stream earlier on today. We wanted to see if Bitcoin could sustain its move to the upside, and it's starting to show promise of that as well. Notice how earlier on today, how they came back into the daily open with that spike to the downside. Now, that, of course, was brought on when we were talking about the VWAP right there, and we were waiting for the test of the VWAP for Bitcoin because the VWAP would give us the understanding that price was looking to go higher. Why? Because when they broke the VWAP, as they went back down towards that 27, this was the zone that Bitcoin came down. It came down towards, where is it? Right here at 27,724. That is where Bitcoin had made its way down towards inside of this area right here, which they broke the VWAP, but the interest came in from traders. If we look left, you can see that this zone over here, just above my head with that weird face, man, I look so weird, bruv. Man. Anyways, all the commitment that was coming in inside of this area right here stepped in at that point in the chart. This is really important with the book map because it tells you where the interest is going to step in if price makes it towards those zones. On that token, you can see that from the move from that zone from the VWAP, they managed to break even higher and take out some excellent zones. They took out the critical 28,449. And if we go over to the high block itself, you can see that they actually attacked that liquidity. So if we refresh the chart right here, you'll see that they came up to it. Um, it was earlier on today. They came up towards, no, not that's not the right. Yes, yeah, they came up towards that liquidity zone right there, 28,475. They narrowly missed that zone. And now we've got more liquidations coming in at 28,550. Now that's critical. Why? Because we're seeing more people now still opening shorts. They are fighting the trend, okay? What usually happens is this, guys. You see this behavior right here? Price marks up, it comes down. Price marks up, it comes down. Look at the green vector candle. Price is marking up, they bring it back down again. Market maker, in essence, is trying to probe traders to believe that this is the top. And when he spikes up price, he's taking out all the retail traders who are going short. Okay? Now, let me draw your attention to something with Bitcoin on exo charts. Look at this. So this is the delta on exo charts. Now, this tells me how much in terms of each candlestick right here in the volume of delta. So if it's above 10 million, well, if it's at 10 million, a new candlestick will print itself. Now, I want to draw your attention to something, okay? Bitcoin right now has done one, two, three hits towards this area around the 28,500 zone. 
Now, if we just go back in time and look at Bitcoin when it last did this move to the upside, similar move to the upside, what I'm looking for is the trigger point for sales to come in. So if you notice here, there was 309 bids hit, okay? So this is where, in principle, aggressive sellers started to come in, all right? Again, another zone, 696 sellers came in at this point. And then 219 sellers came in at this point, okay? Now, what's interesting about this is the bids and the ask are sort of opposite. So you've got when price is going down, aggressive sellers are coming in, but limit buyers are being brought. So those are passive buyers. Then when prices are going up, when they're lifting the ask, it means aggressive buyers are stepping in, but passive sellers are being engaged. And looking at this, you can see that 309 bids were hit at the top side of the move to the upside with Bitcoin over here. Back when it was at 25,254, you can see that that led to a bigger drop down. Even if you focus here, you can see 943 on the sales right there. So that is giving me an insight into them selling from the highest point. And it's about the behavior of investors selling at certain points. You sell, you buy low, you sell high. And that's where the bid started to come in with aggression. So what I'm trying to convey to you all is this. Are we seeing that now with Bitcoin? So let's go to the current price action with Bitcoin on these hits to the upside. So we've had three consecutive hits, all right, in terms of the volume on the delta. I don't really see any selling other than this 299. So there's one area right there that they've sold from, okay? At the same time, where do I see interest coming in? Well, you can see down here that we've got some big orders 444 Bitcoin there. And then, of course, you've got 3,600 Bitcoin orders. Midpoint right here, you've also got 1,200 Bitcoin orders. Yes, granted, there is 11,000 Bitcoin orders inside of that zone, which might be a little bit of a cause for concern for me. OK, we've gotten even <laughs> as you see this, you'll say to yourself, hold on a second. Is this going to start something? Again, look at this. You've got 253 here. You've also got 781 right there. So now you're starting to see the picture here. What do you see more of? Do you see more of sales imbalance or do you see more buys imbalance? Wherever the imbalance presents itself is usually the opposite of what's going to happen. OK, in other words, if you're seeing it moving up, then it's probably likely to come down because that is where you've got an influx of traders that believe now's the time to go long. Notice how every time you see this delta area here, this is where price is being pushed up. If they can't sustain that and the sales get triggered as it tries to close off with this candle, we would expect it to start rolling back over to test the intention of traders inside of these zones, because this zone right here is where they last grabbed the interest from traders. OK, again, last grab the interest of traders where they moved up from. So principally, you would expect them to try and test these zones as areas of support, which is what they tried to do earlier on today in this candle. OK, now going back into the chart itself, you can see Bitcoin did come down, came back up and then an aggressive red vector candle appeared above the 50 EMA. Now, this is important. Why? Because if it can't break down from the 50 EMA on this one hour time frame, Usually on a shorter time frame basis, we would expect Bitcoin to continue higher. Can we justify Bitcoin's movement to the upside? Well, we do have FOMC coming out tomorrow. So Bitcoin, quite frankly, could end up trading sideways, ladies and gentlemen, as we stipulated earlier on today. Now, if we pull on the VWAP itself, you can see that there's a rotation happening. Look at the VWAP. It's flat. So there seems to be an even distribution of volume around certain areas. They come up towards these zones and then they reject the zones. OK, that's telling you it's a rotation, which is suggesting that there's no trend just right now. All right. We want to see a trend like this. You see that bad boy? That is a clean trend. It's moving up, moving away from the VWAP, back down into it, continue back up. But Bitcoin hasn't really moved away from the VWAP as well. So you can see that they are actually preparing for FOMC. OK, now moving on from that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to XRP for a split second. And the news is hitting the scene that XRP Wales anticipate a favorable outcome in the Ripple versus SEC lawsuit. Happy days to all the XRP gang. Let's have a quick look at XRP's price action right now. Let me just sort this bad boy out here. Here we go. XRP, where are you? Cool. Wow. Very good. Look left, only to recover some critical vector regions right there in the chart, ladies and gentlemen. I know you guys have seen it. They've taken back some very important zones in the vector points. You can see XRP, we've been marking this for a long time. 
and you've now and they've now managed to work their way up towards this zone, recovering the vector candles. XRP in principle would need to break the 52 zone, which we could actually expect XRP to come up to tap this zone, come back and pull ever so slightly to initiate a continuation back up again. Because it can't continuously go up all the time. There has to be a little bit of a pullback because there'll be investors that are looking to sell inside from profits earned from this move down here. So naturally, we expect retraces to come in with XRP. But look, the hype is there. XRP well numbers have grown as large as investors stockpile 420 million tokens. Happy days. OK, so we are expecting some interesting volatility from XRP in the coming days. Just remember, if you've taken advantage of any leverage trades with XRP, make sure you pay yourselves. OK, now moving on. This is the story right now that we have with the S&P and, of course, the Nasdaq and everyone around Wall Street on the fear that the markets are not really looking forward to the Federal Reserve's meeting tomorrow. OK, 25 basis points are being banked in. And one key note that was mentioned by a Bank of America analyst is he has compared the actual yields market like a meme stock. OK, remember GameStop? Madness. Shooting up, shoots back down again. But the yields? Nah, you can't have the treasury yields being as volatile as a meme stock. So we go over to the yields themselves and we have a look at what the story is over there. Of course, last week they took a nosedive to the downside. You don't see this behavior, guys. You don't see this happening in the yields. Governments do this to the yields. All right. And the last time this bad boy did this was back in 2007, 2008, when the financial crisis actually came about. And then in 2009, 3rd of January, Bitcoin was created happy days. So if we're going to look back in time and speculate on things. We are in, in essence, a financial crisis. What's going to happen next? The rise of Bitcoin? What's changed your tone, Tino? Not Nothing much, really, because we need to really see Bitcoin show its worth, okay? We need Bitcoin to keep going. Expect retraces. Come on, you've got to expect it. But the next area of resistance for Bitcoin would be this zone right here that we need to break, the key 30K zone. That's what it's all about. And remember, Bitcoin is about people just putting the money in. If XRP is going to start the party, then happy days. We would expect it to continue higher. But if Bitcoin dismisses the news tomorrow, then that's a good sign. We go in towards the dominance of the dollar, and you can see dollar itself has actually started to hold out at a very important support zone. These are the two zones of importance for dollar index itself. They are both areas of support where investors naturally loaded up on cash on the dollar. OK, these are where we could expect price to end up if they do continue to send the dollar dominance down. And at the same token, we have a look at euro and you can see it's doing ever so well to try and climb back up into this. zone. we've got one area right here that we could expect euro to try and finalize from. But of course, with the news announcements tomorrow, we will get a lot of volatility. So whatever happens and it moves up again, take some profits, ladies and gentlemen, and just be very cautious about trading during the FOMC. It's 30 minutes. All right. Let's be safe. It's one hour that you just need to sit back and let the market do its business so you know exactly where you stand. OK, don't compromise your capital. Don't take the gamble because anyone trading into the FOMC or during the FOMC is just gambling. Now, if you're going to take trading seriously, you know not to expose your capital to the most uncertain time in the marketplace. Granted, it could shoot up from there, but it doesn't always work out like that all the time. OK, now something else you want to be looking at. Here we go. So, as I said earlier on, Fed faces a nearly impossible task. Keep inflation, fighting cred and financial stability. This is what the problem is. Do they keep inflation as it is? Do they not worry about it or do they protect the banks? Well, the banks have effectively been saved. But word on the street is suggesting that there are probably going to be more banking failures coming up. You know, Mr. Fink, he did say it. BlackRock, CEO, suggested that this could lead to a domino effect. So one way or another, these banks are all, in essence, going for cheap. As long as banks save banks and the US does protect um, the depositors' balances, then happy days. It will look like that the banking sector doesn't really have a problem. And the only people that are happy days about the banking sector are the ones who are buying up all the stock for the cheap. OK, now moving on from that, we've got articles like this. My guy, Leon Cooperman, is suggesting that the U.S. is going through a textbook financial crisis. All right. It's always with banks that start the financial crisis. More so, he's suggesting that a drop of around 22 percent could happen on the S&P. All right. Now, when a billionaire turns around and says this sort of thing, you start to think to yourself, well, look, if he's if he's a billionaire, I'm, I'm going to listen to this guy because he's obviously made his 
investments and he's now become a billionaire. Look at how old the guy is. He looks like he stood through the test of time, all right? But if the market just keeps on going and going and going and going, okay, it doesn't discredit what this guy says. Does that mean that the market is going to go down? Does he lose credibility when he says that it's not going to ever hit the high for a long time? Well, what's a long time? Well, the area that he's talking about was around the 4,800 zone. Here we go. So S&P could plunge to 3,100. And there it is. I think 4,800 on the S&P will be a high that will stand for quite some time. So let's go over to the S&P itself and have a look at what the story is over there. So S&P, the last time it made that high, let's go into the 12-hour time frame. You can see that was the last time that the S&P made that 4,800 zone, okay? So you, what you've got to consider is the markets, in essence, it's not that they're trending in a bull market. It's just trading sideways. And we're now waiting to see if we are going to start kicking off with the move to the upside or to the downside. This is the principle right here. Now, granted, S&P needs to get above this 800 EMA and hold. As you can see right there, there are a lot of guys on Twitter looking at this trend line on the 200 EMA. Again, it's made its move above that point, come back down. It's made its move again to recover the red vector candle region right there. If there's no red vector candles in the chart nearby, we would assume that they're done with this area and then we would expect them to bring it back down again. This is our zone. If S&P can't hold this 4,100 region, then it's more than likely that S&P is going to drop. But then will Bitcoin drop, given that it does have a 70% correlation to the S&P? We're not going to know until it happens. But so far, Bitcoin is bucking the trend, ladies and gentlemen. And that's great news for anyone holding Bitcoin. More so, I want to draw your attention to something. Nuclear plant, right? accidentally leaked 400,000 gallons of radioactive water. Oh, my days. The irony is that this happened back in November. The U.S. government was aware of it, but didn't say anything. And we're just being told about it right now. That's a little bit of a cause for concern. You know, when you sat there Googling, looking for news, and this happened in November, and we hear about it now, and then you've got the issues with Ohio, it starts to make you think about things. Why would you not mention anything about a radioactive leak in water? It makes you question, doesn't it? What, don't they want to scare people? Well, hold on. If you don't want to scare people, how about you just tell them to at least make them be aware of it, put provisions in place and sort the thing out? That's for another story. Something that you might want to be paying attention to, okay? We focus exclusively on jobs reports when we talk about the Forex markets, crypto markets, the stock market, commodities, you name it. Now, we always wait for the unemployment claims and we always wait for the job earnings announcements. You name it. We're always there at the charts waiting to see if it's going to be a positive figure or a negative figure. But word on the street is suggesting that most of these job listings abound and many are fake. OK, so the job jolts job openings declares that we have 10.8 million jobs available. OK, so what this is saying to me is. There is 10.8 million jobs openings in January, according to the Labor Department. All right. But it's saying that most of these jobs are only listed just to make it look like the company is progressing just so that they keep investors and shareholders happy that there's progression in the company. So what I'm suggesting here is, is this 10.8 million job openings number, is it really valid? How can we use it as a metric if... They're not really posting these jobs and people ain't even taking these jobs, you know, something to question. And then you go back to the idea of the nuclear waste. Why wouldn't you say anything? And then you've got fake job announcements, which are based, which is what the government is basing its information on. Well, look, that's the job openings report figure right there. How is that derived based on how many jobs are available? And if they're all but fake, then that's a little bit of a problem now, isn't it? So what do you trust? More importantly, oil. Now, this is all to do with oil right now, but oil has been taking a bit of a nosedive because of what's been happening with regards to the banking sector. All right. Investors are now coming away from risk and looking to put it into more safer havens like gold, maybe bonds, the Japanese yen. But Russia right now is talking about cutting oil's output. Now, there's two ways that we can profit from this, and I want you to stick with me on this one because I'm going to take you back in time to when there was the last time that something was cut, which caused madness in the US, okay? Stick with me on this one. Back in 2018, China was cutting the rare earth output, and that caused a big problem for the United States. Well, why is 
what is rare earth metals, okay? What are they? Rare earth metals are quite simply metals that we use in everyday technology. Your smartphone's made of them. The camera I'm speaking on right now is packed with rare earth metals. The phone, of course, that you're watching this on or the computer is packed with rare earth metals and most of them come from China. Happy days. So if in this current climate, China were to step up and do the same thing again and declare another cut on rare earth metals, then you'd be squeezing the US economy big time. So why am I talking about this? Well, we're going to be going into what rare earth metals are and what we can take advantage of in relation to commodities, all right? So we know right now gold is the big thing, and it's looking like it's going to push up towards the 2000 and beyond, all right? Let me draw your attention to something. If you don't want to buy gold physically and you want to invest in a company that deals with gold, then you've got another option. Barrick Gold is a company that mines, it's a Canadian company that, of course, is involved in the production of copper in Canada, US, Peru, Chile, and nine other countries, all right? So if you don't want to buy physical gold, or you don't want to trade physical gold, or trade gold itself, you can invest in a company that actually goes out and mines it and looks for it, okay? So usually what you see is, is the price of gold is not going to be dependent on what this company does, OK, if they find a big gold find and they're like, oh, we've struck gold, they might want to keep that a little bit quiet because then there's more of a supply and that kind of deflates the value of gold. OK, but you can see that this company is doing relatively well in the current climates. And this is the weekly time frame. We go into other companies in the sector itself. And you've got um, Caledonia Mining, can't even say that correctly, engaged in operation of a gold mine and exploration development of mineral properties for precious metals. Okay, so precious metals, and then we go into rare earth metals as well. You don't think these guys are looking for that kind of thing? Look at how well this company stock's doing right now. Projecting to not really earn so much next year on its earnings estimates, but overall, they've been doing really well. If we actually look at their sales, they're starting to increase as well. So it's been it's been a good time for this company, which is naturally where you're seeing their stock price moving up. And it's only fifteen dollars. Now, if gold does shoot up to two thousand dollars and beyond and goes to three thousand dollars, which is what people are projecting gold to end up at. You think a company like this is going to be doing very well? I would think so. Another company could be. Or Cisco Gold Royalties, Canada-based again, company engaged in the business of acquiring and managing royalty assets in the gold sector. So it's nothing to sniff about. I mean, look at this company. It's doing fire. Okay, management owns 1% of the stock, but funds own 61% of the stock. Okay, so funds involvement is around 61% of the stock has been accumulated by funds. And as you can see from December, September quarter 22 to December quarter 22, they moved it in terms of funds ownership by nearly 30. How many is that? 10, 12, 255 to 263. Okay, so they're doing really well. Eight, nine more funds have got involved in it. But as you can see from March 22, it went 257, 252. Then it started to pick up again in the last two quarters. Okay. So with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, we are going into the most anticipated news announcements for the US, okay? Again, just trade with safety in your minds. That's all you've got to do. Don't risk too much money. If you are in longs, bank some profits because you know what FOMC is like. They can run it to the downside. They can run it to the upside. As much as we are so optimistic about price action, and hopefully we do see Bitcoin break the 30K zone, hopefully tomorrow they don't pull the dirty. They make price move up and then the press conference comes out and then they rip it back down again. We don't want anything like that to be said in the press conference. But then again, we don't know what they're going to be asking in the press conference. So from now until tomorrow, get yourselves prepared. It's going to be a very interesting life. So if you haven't done so, make sure you like the stream. Make sure you subscribe so you get notified about tomorrow. And if you are completely new to this channel, welcome to Traders Reality. My name is Tino. If you haven't done so, go over to tradersreality.com where you can download the indicator that I use, which is the hybrid system. And if you want to learn more about projections and how to understand the hybrid system, check out the Patreon where I give you guys daily updates on certain strategies and plays within certain assets and various markets across the board. All right. Mad love and respect, guys. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. I'll be checking in with you then. Peace.